really quickly, Regenerix is a late stage proprietary allogeneic cell therapy platform for um, multiple indications in clinical development. Um, it allows us to provide stem cell transplants safely for unmatched and unrelated donors, which is a much broader range than is normally applied clinically. The non-myeloablative conditioning allows for outpatient management. And our most active IND is a phase three um, for living donor kidney transplant, and, and we're quite far along in that, in, for, in, in phase two generating data that support going on to the phase three. We have a GMP uh, phase three and commercial ready manufacturing facility um, and very compelling results from our phase two study in compared to a standard of care cohort that was transplanted at the same time as the patients that we transplanted as a comparison. 70% of our transplanted subjects um, have successfully been removed from all immunosuppressive therapy 12 months post-transplant, and the follow-up is four months to 92 months. And we have very significant differences in uh, comorbidities and also uh, absence of rejection in our cohort compared to about a 30% incidence of biopsy-proven acute rejection um, within five years in the standard of care patients. Because organ transplant is a high unmet need, uh, we were able to achieve orphan drug designation in the U.S. And we also just, uh, as of December 20th, received regenerative medicine advanced therapy designation by the U.S. FDA. We've chosen um, our most mature indication is the organ transplant tolerance um, and our technology can be applicable to deceased donors as well as living donors. Um, the severe autoimmune disorders are our second priority based on data that we have from the phase two kidney study where patients who were durably chimeric did not have recurrence of autoimmune disease, whereas patients who were transiently chimeric did. And there's a body of literature that uh, has been published for both autologous transplantation clinically and also allogenic that bone marrow transplantation can actually stop the progression of the autoimmune process. And our applications could also apply to um, the blood disorders and uh, hemoglobinopathies and rare, rare childhood disorders. The journey of the donor and recipient are shown here. The donor is mobilized with GCSF, and apheresis performed as an outpatient. The product is shipped to us and manufactured. The patient then, and, and then cryopreserved and shipped back to the site. The patient, um, at least two weeks later, undergoes non-myeloablative conditioning as an outpatient, then is admitted to the hospital, has their kidney transplant, uh, the following day their FCRX infusion, and then they're discharged and, and managed as outpatients. And this is one of our, this is our first successful patient, actually, who's 92 months out. Um, he says he's never felt better in his life. He had polycystic kidney disease, and he um, started feeling ill as a teenager and did not tolerate dialysis well at all when he underwent dialysis, and now he's living a, a very robust, normal life. And so in summary, we now have 37 um, up to unmatched, unrelated subjects transplanted in the phase two study. We have similar graft and patient survival compared to standard of care at two, three, and five years. 70% um, of our transplanted subjects have re been removed from <coughs> immunosuppressive therapy 12 months following transplantation. And this is the largest cohort of tolerant kidney recipients that has ever been reported. Um, and our initial assessment of the standard of care cohort relative to the tolerant are superior EGFR, which is the function of the kidney for filtration, highly significantly superior in the durably chimeric compared to the um, standard of care and in the transiently chimeric in the middle between the two. So even a, in a way a positive outcome for that. And the comorbidities that cause a mortality rate of about 50% by 10 years after transplant are significantly reduced in our subjects. And with that, I'll take questions. So Susan, your 
technology clearly has uh, a number of potential applications. For organ transplant, what factors went into your decision to choose to go for kidney first? Um, I'm a solid organ transplant surgeon by training, and I've seen the ravages that the immunosuppressive agents have on our patients. And for those of you who haven't had a friend who's had a transplant or a family member, um, it isn't easy. They have to take 25 pills a day. Uh, if they miss their pills, they can reject their transplant. They have to worry about infections. They can't swim in fresh water because of the risk of infections. Um, they, their, their lifestyle is really compromised. And so it's been really gratifying to see the patients that are durably chimeric in our series who can lead a normal lifestyle and swim in fresh water and not have to worry about infection and travel overseas. And so it, it really is a change in, in quality of life. And, you know, f from your phase two, what else have you learned about either procedure-related techniques or post-procedure patient care that will help inform your, your phase three study? We really learned a great deal. Um, we're approaching it from vein to vein because really how you collect the apheresis product all the way through how you ship the product, how you do the manufacturing, management of the patients. The normally bone marrow, patient, uh, bone marrow physicians and surgeons don't talk to each other. Um, and it really needs to be a hybrid of management because some of the drugs that the tr solid organ transplanters use to prevent infection are very toxic to the marrow. So we've proceduralized every step. And when we initiate a site, um, we have a handbook for apheresis and do training. We have a handbook for how to ship the product. And it really has to be a chain of custody all the way along until it's in infused. And we have another training program for infusion and, and how to infuse the product. So, you know, if you're going to envision a design of your phase three, what do you, what do you think that's going to look like today at least? Um, the phase three is approved, and it looks very much like the phase two, with the exception that there will be randomization. So it will be a moderate-sized study um, with enough patients to give us statistical powering for commercial launch. And the patients will be, it, it'll be less than 100 in the treatment arm and randomized two to one to the treatment group. Okay, and as far as uh, patient recruitment, once you commence the study, how long do you think it would take to complete the study and then uh, uh, announce uh, data from it? Um, we've talked to a number of experts in the field and that are very familiar with protocol study design and enrollment, and we anticipate that your enrollment will take less than 12 months or about 12 months. Um, we're in discussions with the FDA right now about how long the follow-up should be. Okay, and do you have a sense of what they're leaning towards or they want to see? Um, I think we have an indication, and I think that um, we, we've been part of the, we, we received approval for the RMAT process, which has allowed us a more active dialogue with the FDA, and they've talked to us about potentially requesting accelerated approval after about 24 months, and so I think it'll probably be in that time range. Okay, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the RMAT. Um, and I asked a, another one of the recipients this question earlier, but you know, it is a relatively new program. Uh, we know what its intentions are. From, from your experience, has it made a difference? Um, it, it's still early. We've had an excellent relationship with the FDA for about 15 years, and they've always been responsive. Um, but I have to say that there has been more dialogue than we had had previously on all of our IDEs and INDs, um, and there's a time frame that's lined out in the RMAT, and so we essentially applied for the RMAT, uh, received it on December 20th, and had a meeting scheduled for a type B meeting with them within a very relatively short time frame. And then we submitted our briefing book, and unlike in the past where we would get the questions just the day before the meeting, they actually had an active dialogue where they would send us questions for clarification, we could respond to them. And so I, I, I think it is a good process. And, and you mentioned briefly uh, perhaps the possibility of accelerated approval. How did that come up? Did you? Did you bring that up, or did they actually propose it as a possibility? They actually brought it up. They uh, put it in the minutes that they sent us and in response to our briefing book before the meeting. And then we asked them what they meant by that and to clarify it, and <laughs> it was very nice, very, very good to hear.
Okay, well, great. It's nice to see that uh, that program is providing some benefit. Um, so, obviously, this is your focus, but, you know, assuming you're successful here, what would you move on to next and why? Um, based on the data that have come out on bone marrow transplantation, preventing disease progression and life-threatening autoimmunity, uh, we have elected to pursue scleroderma as our next indication. And probably 20 patients, it, it's such a high admit need and there's no other treatment um, that for patients who have experienced a treatment failure and are in the category of being high risk for death, um, I think it would be a relatively small cohort, like about 20 patients. Okay, and um, do you um, have relationships with the uh, clinics where those patients are treated? How, how difficult would it be to uh, convince them to participate in the study with your technology, do you think? <laughs> I think based on the studies that have been done in the clinic now, including randomized studies in scleroderma, that there would be a real enthusiasm for doing that. But we're, that, that's an area we're beginning to explore. The uh, solid organ transplant indications would be, you know, the sites would already be familiar with the technology. And sites for scleroderma may be different or may be similar. But we're just exploring that now. Okay, and when do you think that might reach the clinic? Um, we're planning to start the phase three kidney patients in 2019 and apply for the IND for the scleroderma somewhere toward the end of 2019. Okay, well, let's, let's shift a little bit to manufacturing and, and tell us how you're doing it. Uh, what kind of economics might possibly involve, be involved? Well, let's, let's focus on cost of goods sold. And... Um, what other improvements as we stand here today you think you might be able to um, implement, especially as you uh, uh, need to scale up? Um, we've done a lot of thinking about that, and very early on we made the decision that we needed to control and own the manufacturing process. And so from the beginning we really um, wanted to lock in the procedure and not have to make major modifications during the phase three. So we have a completely closed system that has been under control since 2008. And we don't anticipate making any major changes for the phase three. Um, I do think that it really is important, and I've heard that at this meeting now too, that a number of other groups have recognized that there really needs to be control of, of the manufacturing. That that's critical when you're using a viable cell product. And, you know, it sounds like the closed system obviously uh, incorporated into the original design. Do you have a sense of uh, where you may be able to um, improve on cost of goods sold, or is that not a concern at this point? Well, I think over time, you know, there definitely can always be, it's always good to have improvement on cost of goods sold, but I think that um, the, the key thing is to do the manufacturing right and to have good outcomes for the patients, and that has to be the number one priority. I know over time people are envisioning automation of processes, and I think that's very good, but all of those things really need to be vetted very thoroughly before they're implemented where they could impact on a patient, either positive or negative. Okay, well, very good. Thank you so much, Susan. Thank you.